So my name is, my name is Tim Mackey. Um, I'm with Citrix. I'm in the Citrix open source business office. I'm the community manager for Zen Server, um, one of its evangelists, uh, an occasional coder. Um, did a little small patch for CloudStack yesterday. It was about 17,000 lines. Um, so it's a pretty good way to start things. Um, I've done a bunch of cool things that you can see up there. I'm not going to describe any of them in great gory detail, but it's always nice when you can use relativity in a problem and make product out of it. Um, if you want to find me, I'm at Zen Server Army on Twitter. Uh, this deck, along with various versions of this, will also be up in my slide share probably by tomorrow evening or so, just depending on my mood. Um, so that's, that's my basic background. Um, I've actually been with Citrix now for a little over 10 years, um, which makes me a lifer uh, in various technology roles, architect, um, consultant, SE, guy who talks, guy who makes things and breaks things. So today we're going to talk about making your cloud stack cloud successful, being out of the box. And internally we have a lot of teams that go and take cloud stack because we're building cloud stack into things like Zen Desktop. We're building cloud as part of Citrix Cloud Platform. And they want to understand the technologies, but they come from a traditional data center management mindset. And when they go and look at cloud stack for the first time, one of the things that they run into is, but it doesn't work the way that I want it to work because the way that I want it to work is based on the best practices that I already have, not necessarily the way the cloud's designed to work, which is kind of what Aaron was talking about in the last session about being able to have uh, essentially native applications designed for the cloud versus enterprise applications, which are enterprise applications. So the first thing is understanding who owns what, uh, which I like to refer to as beware the Kraken. Um, first thing, when I went and built my first cloud stack cloud, it took me six weeks to get my head around the fact that I didn't go into vCenter and manage it. I did not go into Zen Center and manage it. I did not go and do all the things that I used to do before. I did not go and create an NFS SR and have it just work. I did not go and bind ISO libraries. And my templates weren't the same as templates within Zen Server. All of these things are just different. Not worse, not anything else, they're just different. And I see continually people struggling over, well, how do I do this? Oh, I manage my network by going into the network tab and I go and I create new networks and no, you don't do that in CloudStack because CloudStack takes care of these things for you. It's a scalability improvement. It's another management paradigm. So who owns my, what? Who's mine, 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 mine? At the end of the day, that's one of the pieces of success. Um, understanding what the as a service component really means is part of the problem. What are we provisioning? Are we provisioning infrastructure? Are we provisioning apps? Are we provisioning both? Are we what exactly are we provisioning and who owns it? From a management tool set, I already mentioned it about the overlap between the something center and cloud stack itself. Um, the most important piece though is if you're successful and you're truly successful, you've built it, people want to use it. So who owns what? And so this is, this is the, the, the fuzzy part of things. And so that's the fuzzy part of things, that's the backdrop. I'm now going to go into some moderately deep things that most people don't think about when they're trying to design for a cloud. So if I look at traditional server virtualization, which is where a lot of these people are coming from, they're used to things like VM densities in the teens, single digits teens. They're loose, used to doing things like not necessarily overcommitting memory, not necessarily overcommitting CPU. I want to make certain that I get guaranteed performance out of the thing that I'm provisioning. I have whatever my management paradigm is on top of this. The things like I.O., they're relatively low. Um, there's really no templates. They're going to do whatever they wanted to do, and it'll be whatever that they've built. And so that's the traditional world. That's what they're usually thinking about. Next step up, very citrix -y, desktop virtualization. In a desktop virtualization environment, you're doing a lot of overcommit. You've introduced the concept of templates. There is one Windows XP, one Windows 7, one uh, Windows 7 with these apps already built into it that you're doing as your deployment. You have now concepts of boot storms. You have I.O. constraints. You have overcommit of resources. And your VM density has now jumped up. And I put up there 50 to 100 VMs per host. And that's kind of the average mark that we see. And when you start to throw things in like graphics and uh, higher uh, CPU requirements for different types of workloads, it will go down. And that's where the templated model starts to play out, where you want to say, this type of cluster is going to behave this way, because it has that type of hardware in it, which also means that it has, well, that type of usage profile. 
mapping that into CloudStack, that could be a zone where you now have the templates that are going to be provisioned for that zone map into things. If I bump myself up to cloud services, the VM density jumps again. I could be looking at 50, 250 VMs. With the latest Zen server, we're up to 650 VMs we can support on a host. VMware's had 512 for ages. Um, Microsoft has now 1024 VMs per host as their stated maximum. So th the densities have gone way up, but this is also a largely templated environment. Indeterminate network profiles. Who knows exactly what's gonna be running at what point in time? How am I gonna separate this? Is all part of the puzzle. So that's the VM density part. And so that's, again, a paradigm shift. If I wanna take a look at network operations, well, I first have to go all the way back to the beginning. In the world before virtualization, everything was nice and simple. You had a physical host, you had a physical switch, you had a wire that went between the two of them, and it did something. What it did, it did. And if I wanted to do, say, port mirroring, or I wanted to monitor it, I wanted to, to define some policies on it, it was very simple because I had that machine, and I had that switch port, and I could do whatever I needed to do. But along comes virtualization. Now I've jammed a whole bunch of things on top of a single host. So if I wanted to filter traffic for a specific service, well, that's a little bit harder because, well, I have to filter as opposed to I just know. And it actually becomes a little bit more complicated when a VM moves from one host to another because everything that I've defined, the physical layer, well, it doesn't work because it's now on a different physical host and the ports aren't matching and so forth. So that's a simple mirroring traffic problem. If I look at the, and I'll skip over that part, if I look at network policies, I have, as a virtual machine, as a, as a workload administrator, I have the ability to control the IP address and the ports and the applications that are running in it. As a virtualization administrator, I have the ability to control the MAC address, which means that if someone's gonna co-opt a system, they have admin rights on the service, well, they can go and do whatever. If they have virtualization admin rights, they can now define things that can go and subvert the policies that have been defined. So by going directly at the virtual switch, I can go and say, this service is bound to this MAC address which has this port, which has uh, this protocol, which has these IP addresses, and now wherever that VM happens to live in my environment, those policies are applied to the thing, the VM, and even if it's subverted, you can't go and mess with it on the network. But when you take a look at network tools, they have a certain philosophy. The philosophy is, I have a physical environment. I have 2448 port switches. I'm not dynamically creating things. I'm not having people randomly running out there and plugging things in and unplugging things in random orders. But in virtualized world, you do have that. You start up one VM. Well, that might have port one, second one, port two, and so forth. You move the machine that had port two from one host to another. Well, that port two is now port 16 on the new host, and port two is now vacant. And the new VM that gets created on the first host might get port two. So all of these things start to play into how the tools work. And most of the tools today still, and this slide's actually three years old, most tools today are still polled. They still assume that you have this largely static environment. So in a cloud operations world, being able to understand what you have is very difficult if you're using traditional management tools because the topology is always changing. Things are always coming up and going down because after all, we have a successful cloud. And what am I gonna to do to manage and monitor it? So, hit that. Uh, my most favorite and most insidious of problems. So, when I have a high dense, highly dense, hyper dense environment, and I have, say, Zen Server 6.2 with 500 VMs, or vSphere with 500, or so forth, and I wanna run all those VMs, and I wanna run them in a rack that contains whatever number of hosts that I can cram in that rack, and I've got a top of rack switch. It should all just work. You're laughing. What's the problem? So if I take a legacy switch, say like a Catalyst 3570V2, that has an ARP table depth of between 6,000 and 12,000, depending on how you set it up. Do the math off of any of these uh, virtual machine densities, and what happens when you create that nth plus one VM? The VM starts, the VM's 
working from its perspective, but it can't connect to the network because of an ARP limitation. Okay, so that's an older switch. It's probably the, one of the ones that you might have as your first cloud too, but let's just say that you've got a lot of money and you can go buy some UCS. Well, the same constraints exist in the fabric extenders. They have the same 6,000 to 12,000 ARP cable. So all you've done is you've shrinked the problem in terms of the, the host, but you still have that problem. And as virtual machine densities increase, you start to end up with smaller VMs trying to do more interesting things, you can actually create a problem where things start and they don't necessarily work the way that you expect them to. So, well, and those guys don't start. So that's the networking. We've got density, we've got network, now on for storage, because after all, these things need to live someplace. So, I'm designing a new cloud service, and I want to have that cloud service be able to host, say, 500 VMs. And this is actually just random arbitrary units down here. It's not, somebody once pointed out to me that that looks an awful lot like Australian dollars. Um, as you progress up the, the chart, the provisioning efficiency is going to drop. And when you hit 500, okay, it's gonna be at its worst possible performance. Design-wise, I wanna be able to go step 500, 1,000, and so forth to scale out my environment. But if I have a traditional storage system behind this, what I actually see is I go 500, maybe I get to 750, maybe I get to 1,000, now I gotta do a redesign. So what's my alternative? Where are my bottlenecks? How do I actually scale this thing out? So we can have storage per pod. So now if I have storage per pod, I can have controllers that are doing the right things, that have an IO performance uh, envelope that we understand and we can actually design against. And so I can go and scale that and do the right things. However, that can be pretty expensive in time. So there is actually a better way. What if instead of doing this in 500 VM chunks, what if I was doing it in say 50 VM chunks and using local storage instead? Now I don't have the shared storage limitations of controller IO envelopes and so forth. I don't have the benefit of live migration, but I'm trading it off in terms of a more deterministic design. So where is my cost versus my scalability? And I see a puzzled look on your face, and I will fill that puzzled look in in about four slides. So if I look at the cost performance trend, I'm seeing this is where my redesign occurs here. So I can go and do a pods, and that's cool. Or I can go and take a look at local storage, and I can get something that looks an awful lot like this. And that's why a lot of people, when they start looking at how I'm going to do cloud, go towards a local storage-based solution. because. When you buy the server, you probably have some amount of local storage in it, and today, it's probably a lot of local storage, which can hold a lot of VMs. But a lot of storage doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna perform well. So we have to understand how the disk usage is in place. So uh, see how the colors turned out when I reformatted this. Okay, so user data is purple, the OS partition is blue, the, t the individual VM's disk is the combination of the two, and you get some amount of swap for the hypervisor to do its thing. And that's your total disk. So if I'm looking at the amount of VMs that I can fit on there, I know the size of the disk, I know what the OS partition plus the user data is, I can build out a formula that says, this is how many VMs I can fit on here. And that's assuming a fully inflated underlying disk image, which is fine. That actually makes life very simple, but it's not overly efficient. So if I take a look at this instead with thin provisioning, or for that matter, even sparse allocation. I come back with, I still have my swap space, I have an OS partition, my user data is gonna be whatever it's gonna be, but because it's thin provisioned, I can now clone off of all of these things and end up with a very small um, OS partition. Tremendous benefit when you're talking about templated environments, like what we have in cloud. Because now, the data is what's consuming the disk, not all this relatively constant OS crap. It gives me a VM count. If I look at the performance, I can go and take a look at what type of disk do I have in the system. SSDs obviously have an incredible amount of IOPS behind them. What is the right penalty associated with it? This is put your values in here that make sense. These make sense for a little bit more of a desktop-y Windows type world. Plug all of that in and you now end up with a VM count that is IOPS divided by IOPS per VM. 
What is the constraint for your storage? What do you need to have? One of those three things is going to be your limiting factor, and that's going to be a lot closer to what you actually want to have for your type of storage. SSD local storage, okay, cool. Spinning disk local storage, cool. Shared disk local storage, uh, shared disk uh, with SSD back caches, what, what have you, that'll all play into this. So, those are our three big things. Now, we really do want to have a successful cloud. So the first thing to do is take a look at some of the other clouds that are out there. And I really do like the Zynga one because the analogy here is that a public cloud is a minivan. Minivans can hold lots of things. They go a reasonable speed. They have lots of little features that maybe you use or you don't use. And there's nothing really sexy about them. They're not tuned for your applications. They're not gonna do everything that you wanna do. So the Z Cloud within Zynga, that, they have the analogy that this is a race car. It is purpose-built and tuned for their application set. Built off of Cloud Stack, optimized for social gaming, and built around the requirements of their application. So things like in-memory databases, single-digit latency between compute nodes, all of these things that they wanted to control that they couldn't control in a public cloud scenario. They looked at it from a costing perspective. Why should I rent what I can own for less? But if you're gonna own it for less, you actually have to know what owning it means. I was talking to a customer uh, about two and a half months ago that they went on this grand public cloud, uh, this grand cloud initiative, and what they ended up with was a cost per VM of $1,000 per month. And that was because they looked at it from, I have the enterprise data center requirements to have servers that look like this, storage that looks like that, and a network that looks like this other thing. So they bundled it all together and they ended up with storage that made no sense in a cloud, network management overhead that made no sense in a cloud, and a VM density that made no sense in a cloud. They ran that for about six months before some audit came along and said, um, guys, you can do better. And they went back and they re-architected this and they're now looking at something closer to about $150 per VM. And in their case, they actually had to just change out what they were doing for storage because it was the storage component that was the big cost. It wasn't something like, say, vSphere licenses or something like that. Optimizing applications might be part of it. Understanding how the usage profile is gonna be when somebody wants a new something. So you get an open enrollment, you get a very popular website, you get a whatever, what's the spike look like and who's gonna actually own that. And then look at how outages do work and what you're gonna do when they do happen. Telcos, they look at things a little bit differently. They have a utility computing model at the outset. You go and you wanna sign up for a new cell phone plan, you can get that cell phone pretty quick. You can add all your data plans, you can add your voice elements to it, you can subscribe to any number of features and they have this laundry list of menu that you can go and say, I want, I want, I want, cool, oops, wait a minute, I don't wanna spend that kind of money so let's get rid of a few things. They have that whole self-service flexibility piece as a core tenant. They understand that all of these things cost money and that when you spend more money, you should have more feature function as a result of it. And so that's one of the, the, the tenants that if you had that $1,000 VM, well, you had to have a good reason for it and the guy who was deciding that they wanted to provision that VM should have a sense of the cost that that was going to have so that they can make that informed decision. Things like provisioning agility, fully expected and detailed billing and so forth. So if I bring this all together, thing number one, decide what it is that you want to do with your first cloud. Is your first cloud an SAP virtualization project? Probably not gonna be a successful one at the outset. Is your first cloud something that's looking at, say, web services? Or maybe it's going to take some um, simpler applications like say file print servers or whatever. What did we learn from virtualization? We took the simple things first, we were successful. What are the things that we can be successful with first? Because at the end of the day, this whole idea of fail fast and fail often doesn't work with your boss. He doesn't wanna hear, yeah, it didn't work this time. Yeah, we, we tried it and it still didn't work and it still didn't work. He wants to see this thing works because he wants to have a cloud. He wants a cloud because all of his golfing buddies have clouds and he needs to have a cloud. And so 
when he has a successful cloud, then he can brag about this cloud that he's got. And you can build more cloud services in and it becomes a self-perpetuating truism. So who's gonna have access to it? How are they gonna manage it? And when? What types of operating systems do you wanna support at the outset? Not five years down the road, but the, la the next six, 12 months. Do you wanna make it only Linux? Do you wanna throw some windows in there? Do you wanna throw some windows in it? Is it server, is it desktop? Is it a specific version? What type of applications? How is this all gonna be played together? Who owns backup and monitoring? What does compliance look like? Do you wanna even touch the third rail of compliance with your first cloud? Most people say probably not. From there, define what your tenancy requirements are. If you're building a private cloud, that probably translates into who your, are the business units. What are their real requirements for using this? And you might start out with a single business unit, but you have to design that tenancy in place. So Aaron, in the last session, was talking about enterprise apps versus cloud apps, and he had segmentation for production environments and development environments. Those are tenancy requirements. Those tenancy requirements translate into how you're going to provide the segmentation in here. Do you need VM migration? Well, if you need VM migration, well, you're probably in a pooled environment. You may need to have HA. Well, what does that actually mean in terms of the architecture that you're putting together? What does the network look like? What do keys look like? If I have my keys stored in a central location that everybody has access to, do I really have an isolated tenant environment? Do I have a scenario where someone could subvert the key management system and gain access to something else that they should not have access to? What about proving that this thing is going to work? Do you need some form of showback? Do you need some form of understanding and communication back to the CIO or director of IT or whatnot saying that, you know, we spent X amount of dollars on this thing and yeah, we're actually getting some benefit out of it. And then of course, always the great fun of compliance and audits. At no point in time, well, except for that whole catalyst piece, that I really talk about the hardware. Because the hardware itself, the virtualization components themselves, they should not be your first priority. Who here is running a VMware shop or works with customers with VMware shops? How about KVM-based solutions? Zen server-based solutions? Cool. So if you're a VMware shop and you've always been a VMware shop because VMware has done everything that you need it to do and your first inclination is, well, I just want to put this all on top of VMware, you may not end up with the kind of cloud that you want because you're starting with the infrastructure first instead of what the people want to use it. Let the, the rationale that comes down that says, this is what I want to deliver, this is how I want to deliver it, this is the constraints that I have, dictate that yes, vSphere is the correct answer. Because the correct answer might actually be, vSphere is okay for this part of my cloud, and CloudStack's really cool in that you can have multiple hypervisors, and they can all be tied together in the demo environment that Aaron was using in the last session has exactly that. It's got vSphere, send server, it's got KVM all in the same zone, all nicely tied together so that some applications can deploy on top of vSphere, some on top of Zen server as appropriate. Cost it out the way that it needs, it makes sense to cost it out because from the provisioning perspective, the user shouldn't know and shouldn't care what you've got underneath the covers because you might change your mind a year from now and they shouldn't know. Multiple hypervisors are completely okay. Bare metal as a hypervisor is actually perfectly acceptable. Um, I was talking to uh, one of the consultants and uh, they were telling me about a customer that needed to have bare metal because virtualization scheduling between VMs got in the way of what they wanted to do. They were doing audio video transcoding and they didn't want to have the 1970s kung fu movie syndrome where the mouth is moving and the the actual audio was way out of sync because that required someone to actually watch the movie and QA the movie when they just wanted to shove it through this uh, codec system and pop a movie out at the end. Do I want to pool resources or not? If you want to pool the resources, you're probably looking at shared storage. That's an extra cost. If you, want, if you don't care, local storage is fine. What about cluster size? Zen server has a cluster limit of 16. VMware has a cluster limit of 32. Well, for years as a Zen server guy, I've gotten beaten up over the fact that their number is bigger than our number. And we need to have our number be bigger because, well, their number is bigger. In a cloud environment, it doesn't matter. Because if your cloud is successful, you're gonna blow past the intrinsic cluster limits of your hypervisor before 
you run out of the capabilities of your orchestration layer. So decide something that makes sense for you. Are you talking hosts of one or clusters of one, two, three, four, five, ten? What makes sense for your environment and how do you want to manage it? Uh, primary storage is defined by the hypervisor, and I had a session yesterday that talked about the intersect of all the features and functions that you could come out with, the best hypervisor being the coolest one. Uh, template definition and how storage is going to work, NFS, Swift, S3, but you have to be aware of how those pieces play together. And most importantly, design for maintainability. Outages do happen. Things do break. Things do go down. System VMs are kind of important in cloud stack, and so if they go down, you might not have the access that you expected. If, if it's something like, say, the console proxy and everyone in that zone suddenly can't access their VMs the way that they used to. Understand what it means to have a uh, failure in the hypervisor host or the storage underneath it and how you're going to rectify that both within cloud stack from a management perspective, but also for the instances that are running on it. And what does it mean to support the end user's environment. Maybe your answer is, I'm not going to support them. It's their stuff, they're responsible, but what does that mean when they say, but I can't access the internet? What piece of your stuff could have broken? But the best quote, best quote of two years ago, everyone in enterprise has maintenance windows. Citrix has them every month. They're kind of annoying because it means something broke and now I can't access my email or I can't put an expense report in. But if your cloud has a maintenance window, you've probably done it wrong because your users don't know and don't care. They just want their stuff now. They want their stuff to work now, and they want their stuff to keep working now. And Amazon's kind of set the bar that it sort of just does work that way. So that's it for my presentation. This deck will be up on SlideShare uh, probably by tomorrow. Any questions? Cool, thanks everyone. <laughs>